The other behavior that markedly reduces testosterone in both males and females and markedly reduces the desire for seeking sex and sex itself is illness. And many of you might say, well, duh, when people feel sick, they don't feel like seeking out mates. They don't feel like having sex. But have you ever wondered why that actually is? Well, it turns out that it can be explained by the release of what are called inflammatory cytokines. So cytokines are related to the immune system. They travel in the lymph and in the blood and they attack invader cells like bacteria and viruses. And under conditions of illness, we make a lot of different cytokines. Some of them are anti-inflammatory, but some of them are pro-inflammatory. And the best known example of a pro-inflammatory cytokine is IL-6. And it's known that IL-6, when injected into individuals, will decrease the desire for sex and eventually will reduce levels of testosterone and estrogen, independent of feeling lousy. So the reason why people don't want sex when they're sick is because levels of IL-6 are increased. Now, this is important because as we start to think about the different ways to modulate the sex steroid hormones, so-called optimize the hormones, keeping levels of IL-6 low is going to be important for them to exert their effects. Now, IL-6 doesn't just travel to the gonads and shut down the gonads. It actually has ways to interact with some of the receptors that the steroid hormones, estrogen and testosterone, bind to and impact those receptors so that the sex steroid hormones can't have their effect. In short, and put simply, inflammatory cytokines like IL-6 are bad for sex steroid hormones. And so we're going to talk about how to modulate IL-6 in the direction that you would want and how to increase another cytokine called IL-10, which is anti-inflammatory, in ways that can help promote or at least support the sex steroid hormones. So as we move forward, we're going to now start to consider what sorts of behavioral practices, as well as other things, can modulate the sex steroid hormones in the directions that you want them to go. But before we do that, and in order to set the stage for that, you should be asking yourself, how is it, or why is it, at a mechanistic level, that behaviors can modulate hormones at all? If you think about it, it's kind of strange that just the mere act of being a parent or parenting can change testosterone levels so dramatically or estradiol levels so dramatically. What is it? Is it the sweat of the baby? Is it their saliva? Is it the sight of the baby? Is it holding the baby? Or is it all those things? It turns out that many of those effects are because of smell or in some cases even possibly pheromones. Now, I talked about hormones. Hormones, again, are a chemical that travels in the body, impacts tissues and cells elsewhere in the body. A pheromone is a chemical that's released by one member of a species that goes and impacts members elsewhere, but of the same species or even of other species. Now, pheromone effects are absolutely well established in lots of animal species, but they are very controversial in humans. Today, I'm going to talk about some of the well-established ones in animals. I've mentioned one or two of these before on previous podcasts, but I haven't mentioned several of them. And I'm going to talk about the evidence for pheromones in humans that are well-established. So the main ones in animals that are discussed are called the Lee Boot effect, the Witten effect, the Bruce effect, and the Vandenberg effect, named after the people that discovered them. The Lee Boot effect is when you house females of a given species together with no males, they start displaying longer what are called estrous cycles. In many species, they don't have menstrual cycles, which are 28 days. They have estrous cycles, which tend to be four days or some variant thereof. It's an interesting phenomenon because what it means is that the presence of the male itself is changing the ovulation cycle. 